Okay. Well, you guys had a good weekend. Let's jump back into it. Um, so last time we kind of ended talking about the continuous functions. So. Sometimes we call these the elementary functions. These are the functions that are continuous on their domains. Um, they're particularly nice to do calculus with um, because they sort of behave um, nicely at any point where they are defined. So these guys were the polynomials, the rational functions, it's just a ratio of polynomials, the radicals, it's like square root of x cubed, root of x, etc. Um, the exponential functions, in particular e to the x, um, logarithmic functions, and the trig functions. These were the guys we saw that were continuous on their domain. Well, I just kind of told you. And we also saw that that wasn't a very trivial thing to say because you can, we constructed two separate functions that were defined for all real numbers but weren't continuous on all real numbers. These guys, everywhere they're defined, they are continuous there, and it makes it very nice for the, to work with these functions. Right? So right now we want to talk about some more um, more facts about continuous functions. Because right? calculus only has the potential of working where a function is continuous, and so um, knowing when calculus work, what properties we can take advantage of is going to be important. So suppose f, g, Let's just say they're continuous at A. Let's see the constant. Then it turns out the following are also continuous at A. sum of two continuous functions is also a continuous function. So I know, for example, polynomials are continuous and radicals are continuous. If I add a polynomial to a radical, the result is also continuous. The difference, of course, sum is going to work. The difference is also going to work. Also, the multiplication of continuous functions are continuous functions. Um, and the divisions are continuous uh, provided. that g does not equal zero at the point you're taking the limit. Okay. So it turns out that if you know individual functions are continuous, they remain continuous under certain mathematical operations. You add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, it will remain a continuous function. Division in particular is only will be continuous as long as the denominator is not zero. So that's nice to know. Once I know a function is continuous, we can construct other continuous functions, or we can, if given a function, we can deconstruct it into a bunch of continuous functions. We kind of know that that entire original function was also continuous. So that's, that's nice to know. Um, I'm not going to prove it, just going to state it. Um, to prove things, we kind of need the precise definition of a limit, which I'm hoping we'll get to today. Um, but even then, I won't prove this. We're going to do some very easy examples. So once you know individual functions are continuous, the following are continuous. Uh, now I remember why I told you about C. If you take a constant times a continuous function, it remains continuous. So 
So that's another fact. Typically, this is a theorem. You can label this a theorem. So it's a very important fact that we have to prove to figure out. Another theorem is called the theorem 2, arbitrarily numbering theorems here. Um, is, uh, there is a con continuity that applies to uh, composite functions as well. So suppose as x approaches a of g of x equals b, and f is continuous at x equals b, then it turns out that you can take the limit of the composite function, and that will actually give you uh, f of b as the result. If f is continuous at the output of g at the point a, then f of g of x. some nice theorems. Theorem 2 in particular gives us an idea. You can kind of think of it in a certain way. When you're looking at theorem 2, you can kind of see it in the following way. It's kind of like you can bring the limit inside the function. And knowing that the limit of g is b, you end up with b inside the function. And that's a particular property which we can take advantage of algebraically when talking about continuous functions. So I should probably state that. Yes, that is the next thing I wanted to state. There's an idea, mostly based on theorem two in this case, in which you'll hear people phrase it as limits can pass through continuous functions. And we're actually going to use that idea um, later on. But for now, let's actually just state that. Here's the important idea. Limits can pass through continuous functions. What do I mean by that? For example, we know that the sine, sine is a trig function, that is a continuous function. Uh, in fact, it's continuous everywhere. So for example, if you have a limit of the sine of some function, right? sine is continuous, you can take the limit and you can pass it through the sine function. You can think of this as just sine of the limit of this function. As long as the limit exists, those two will always give you the same answer. Similarly, you know the exponential function is a continuous function. So if you have an exponential raised to a power and there's a function in the power, and you want to find the limit of such an expression, you can take the limit and pass through the exponential. Those would always give you the same answer. And again, there are tons of examples I could give you here. Let's give you one with a log. So if you have ln of some function, as long as this limit exists, it will be equal to that. So there's the idea that there's, you can pass a limit through a continuous function and operate on, directly on its input when finding the limit of the overall function, etc. Non-continuous functions do not behave this way. You can't do this little algebraic trick. And it's very useful 
using this algebraic trick a lot of times. We'll actually use this trick um, later on when proving some derivatives. Right, so continuous functions are nice functions, um, not just for calculus, but in general. However, in calculus, um, they are the only ones with the potential of us being able to do calculus on them. Okay. So we can't find a derivative, for example. And we'll talk about what derivatives are, some of you haven't heard of it. But we can't take a derivative, for example, at a point where a function is discontinuous. So knowing when and where functions are discontinuous is important. And also knowing once you have a continuous function, certain nice properties kind of are given almost for free. Adding two of them, you're still continuous subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Taking compositions under certain considerations is continuous. And you can pass limits through continuous functions. These are all very helpful things to know. And now, I want to end this section with an important consequence of continuity. Um, now this is a theorem, it's one of the big theorems of the semester, it's one of those really important things, like if you go through Calc 1, this is one of the things everyone expects you to know. This is how everyone expects you to know about a derivative. Everyone expects you to know about this thing. We're not going to prove it because even the, the easiest proofs I know of uses something called the completeness axiom of real numbers, and that's something I just don't want to get into at the moment. Um, but it, it's kind of very technical to prove this. But we won't need to prove it. We just know how to use it. We need to know what the statement is. It is called the intermediate value theorem. So there's this thing called the intermediate value theorem. And I might abbreviate this as IVT. And the theorem says the following. Suppose f of x is continuous. You need to pay attention to the intervals here. There are a bunch of theorems that are going to be specific with the intervals, whether it's open or closed, etc. Suppose you have a function that's continuous on a closed interval, meaning at every point on that interval, the limit equation works for continuity. Okay. And suppose that f of a is less than or equal to some number n less than or equal to f of b. Or vice versa. I mean, f of b could also be the one on the left side. But the important is there's a number between the two y values. Does anyone know how to finish the statement? There's a conclusion you can make here, knowing that f is continuous and there's a y value between f of a and f. You saw in high school calculus? Did you see it before? Then there exists a C in the open interval. That this symbol means there exists. Means there exists. Or there is at least one. There exists a number c in the open interval such that f evaluated at that point is actually going to give you the output n. So the idea here. Here you're on a b. And you have some function doing whatever, but we know it's continuous. There are no breaks, no gaps, no nothing. Okay, so it's <coughs> continuous on AB. Now, this is saying 
this here would be f of a, this here would be f of b, and in between those, there's some number n, there's some y value. If the function is continuous, it turns out that there will be a c value, there will be a value in between a and b, strictly speaking, that when you plug that into your function, it will give you the output n. As you can see from this illustration here, the c would be roughly in this location. And regardless of where, which number in between these you pick, regardless of if it was switched this way and the f of b was down here and the f of a was up there, once you have a y value in between these two y values at the endpoints, there must be a value on the inside such that it, the output would give us that value. And you can imagine that if there was a gap or a break in this location, that probably wouldn't have worked out. Right? But to be able to say that in mathematical certain terms, it's kind of very technical and complicated to write up. But that's sort of the idea. Any value between, your function will attain all y values between these guys, assuming it's continuous on a and b. So any y value in between these, there is definitely a number strictly in between a and b that will hit that value when we uh, plug it into the function. Such a value must exist. And this is a consequence of con continuity, right? f has to be continuous for this to be true. If it's not continuous, it's not true. Not in general. Anyway. It's a very important theorem, very important consequence that you should know about continuous functions called the intermediate value theorem. Here's one way in which we can use it. There are several uses for it, and there are a lot of other theorems that we use the intermediate value theorem to prove. But computationally, there's one thing I expect you to be able to do um, with such a problem. So let's look at an example. There are many scenarios in which us being able to solve an equation is a very important thing to be able to do. But by far, most equations are very difficult to solve. Um, this one in particular, um, especially for an algebra or pre-calc or calc 1 student, to solve this directly would be very difficult to do. If you know the formula for finding the solution to a general cubic, even that's going to be really annoying to apply. That formula is not very pretty. Um, but here, you might try to factor this using like the rational roots theorem, which you might have learned in algebra, or something like that. But it's not going to work out very well for you, because your guess is, based on the fact that the coefficient here is 1 and 3, you guess plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3 would solve these guys. And you, if you plug in all those numbers, you'd realize that that's not, uh, not going to work. If you plug in 1, you don't get 0. Plug in minus 1, you don't get 0. Plug in 3, you won't get 0. Plug in minus 3, you won't get 0. So this is kind of a very tough thing to solve. But here we're asking you to show that we know there's a solution, and we know it can be in that interval that's given. Okay? Now, one way in which you can prove that is because we know that that expression, x cubed plus 5x plus 3, is a continuous function, okay? because it's a polynomial. So it means the intermediate value theorem applies. And so if I can show that a, the y value I care about is in between two y values here at the endpoints, we can know that there will. So do we know, remember what a root is? Do you remember what a root is? Just to make sure that we're all using it. What's a root? What's a root of an equation? Yeah, isn't it something zero? So, 
Come again? Is it the same thing as zeros? The zeros, yeah, but what is it? The zeros. What are the zeros? It's where it costs the next axis. Okay, it's the x values for which those are called the zeros, right? So, so for example, the zeros of x squared minus 1 would be x equals plus or minus 1. So the zeros are the x values for which that function will be 0. So I want to show that this equation has at least one solution. And that's just like saying that this expression has a root. Okay, so here's how you would start with a problem. A very typical problem to ask in a Calc 1 class will be something like this. So you might see one root or one solution, etc. And so now you say something like, let f of x equals this function. Then f of x is continuous since it is a <coughs> This means IVT applies on the entire real line it's going to apply because f of x is continuous on the entire real line. In particular, it does apply on the given interval. set it up, you have to check your conditions. And so here's the thing that you would notice. Evaluate f at the endpoints. Here you can note f of minus 1 is going to be what here? What's f of minus 1? Negative 3. Okay. So that's one endpoint, the first one, that's like the a. What is the f of 0? It's 3. Now, there are many things uh, that you can say about negative 3, but in particular, what we care about here is that also note that the number 0 itself would strictly be between f of minus 1 and f of 0. Right? Then the intermediate value theorem implies that there is some c in this interval, in the open interval, minus 1, comma 0, such that f of c is equal to that intermediate value. This C is our solution. And you're done. So the idea here is you had a function between minus 1 and 0. You know that at minus 1, uh, it was at negative 3. So the function is definitely here. You know that at 0, it's at 3. So the function is here. So a function passes through those points, and we know it's continuous, which means whatever it's doing in the middle, we might not know, but it will definitely hit all y values. There must be a point in traveling from this point to that point that you will cross the zero. That's called the intermediate value theorem. Right? So once we have two different y values and our function is continuous on the interval, it will literally attain all y values in between those two. And since one was negative and one was positive, zeros between any negative and positive number, so there must be a point where our function will actually cross the x-axis. Right? And that point will have to exist, there won't be a gap or a hole or a break or an asymptote, because the function is continuous. So there's definitely an input and an output that's going to give us this result. There's definitely going to be a number in this interval that's going to solve that equation. And I want you to be aware that we are not we don't know what that value is, but we know it exists. We know it's there.
there's an idea that people think about mathematics that you always have to have the answer, you always have to be able to solve something nicely. Sometimes this is just not possible. Sometimes the best you can do is approximate an answer. You can know where it lives. And a lot of times that's good enough. So sometimes you, you might realize that, well, the important distinction is that sometimes in real life, being exact is just not possible. So if you, you make a calculation and you know, for example, that okay, to build this house, I need to cut a length of wood exactly pi units long. It turns out that you can't actually do that in reality. Right? Pi is an infinite amount of decimal digits. Whatever machine you're using to cut it will not be infinitely precise. Right? It's going to approximate pi to some number of digits. So all you really need to do at any given point is just be accurate within that amount of decimal places. Sometimes it's not possible and it's not easy to get to the exact answer, but being close enough is going to be good enough. And so, for example, one way of finding this number within some tolerance that we want is just keep closing this interval and keep doing this test. Right? What if I went from minus a half to zero? Would that still work out? So now we know the answer should be between minus a half. And then you kind of close in the window. Right? Eventually, you'll be able to say where your answer is going to be within a certain tolerance or within a certain acceptable error. And a lot of times that's good enough. So when you do a class like numerical analysis, for example, that's a lot of what you're doing. You'll be dealing with equations that you can't really solve nicely by hand. No technique exists, no formula exists. But you're learning how to pro approximate solutions. And for a lot of cases, that's, that's good enough. For a lot of cases, that's the best we can do. And the intermediate value theorem is super useful in this regard. It can help us approximate solutions, know where they live, so we know we can look in this region for the answer, not over there, and that in and of itself can be very useful. So that's the intermediate value theorem. And typically that's the kind of problem that we're going to ask with that um, theorem. <coughs> One thing I want to mention before we end this section, this is the end of the, the, the limit section uh, as we were doing it. A couple of B's and W's. We mentioned the function y equals e to the x before, and I told you the most important function in calculus, the most important function in math. Um, now, because we looked at limits, we can actually write this down precisely. The number e, remember I told you was like 2.718, blah, blah, blah. It's an irrational number. It's a very important irrational number right now. I just want you to be aware that you can actually define this number by a limit. And it's going to be this limit. Okay. So the idea for that, remember, it came from compound interest. And the compound interest formula basically says to find the amount, you take the principal, you multiply by 1 over r over n to the n times t, where t is the time you have the money in the account, n is the number of times it's being compounded per year, r is the interest rate. If you set R equals 100%, which in this case is going to be 1, and set T equals 1 year, and set P equals $1, right? put a dollar in an account, earning a 100% interest rate compounded infinitely often, so you let N go to infinity, which at the time I mentioned this, we didn't really have a way to express that. Limit is a way to express that. And so basically if you do that, Plug in a 1 here, plug in a 1 here, plug in a 1 here, you get that expression. Letting n goes to infinity is taking a limit. You can literally get this number by this limit. In fact, that number was invented by considering this particular limit. That's how we first encountered e. So there, that's the definitive way. I mean, we, we have many ways to express the number e, but that was, prior, that was the, one of the first ways it came about. You can also note the function e to the x can be considered a limit. That's just putting an x instead of the 1 here. That will actually give you the function e to the x. 
We can also do this as a limit approaching zero. So something like E, we also talk about, look at it in a different way instead of going to infinity. That's an equivalent way to write E. And it's a very important limit. It's something you should know by heart and burn into your brain because it's going to pop up all over the place, as I said, especially in calculus. It's one of those things that you should always have in mind, kind of like how you always have the difference of scores formula in your mind. You should always have that particular limit in your mind because if you're doing limit problems, it's a very common thing to show up in practice. So just wanted to make sure that we, we had a good grasp on E. E, by the way, a better way to To define E is via an infinite sum called a power series. So it turns out you can get E by 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6 plus theta. Oh, that's going to be x. And so for E itself, you plug in x equals 1. So you plug it 1 plus 1, you get 2 plus a half plus a 6 plus 1 over 24, etc. Adding all of that infinitely off, adding this entire infinite sum, you would get the number e, or e to the x in this case. This is called a power series. You'll learn about that in Calc 2, but uh, it's one of the best ways to represent the exponential function. For us, though, especially in Calc 1 and from now and forever, you should be able to think of e as these limits. It will be important. Okay. Now, in the remainder of the class, hopefully we've kind of mastered limits so far with what we're being doing, but we've kind of been doing things in a very fuzzy way. Right now we're going to talk about what's called the precise definition of a limit. so far as in, we might not have realized it, which was a very precise way. So I think this is section 1.7 of the text. So the precise definition of the So conceptually, we know that the limit is the y value of function will approach when our x value gets close to something, right? So we say the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l if when x gets close to a, y gets close to l. The problem is the word close is a very vague word. What does that mean? People would read that and close will mean different things to different people. So it turns out that that definition, while it was useful for the computations we were doing, there are situations in which that definition is just not good enough, our functions just don't behave well enough for us to apply that. So something more precise is needed to define a function, what, a limit, what it means for a limit to exist at the point and be a certain value, and this is going to be the definition. So we're re-looking at limits in a more complicated way, I guess, but it's the more precise way to look at it. We'll cover more cases. We say the limit of f of x as x approaches a. is L, so we can make that statement. And write this equation if now here's going to be the definition for all epsilon greater than zero this upside down a means for all or for every greater than zero epsilon greater than zero, comma, there exists a delta greater than zero. Right? So for every positive number epsilon, this is a, another Greek letter here, there will be a positive number delta, 
Another Greek letter, lowercase delta. Such that if the distance between the x value and that a value is less than delta, potentially they are not equal to it, then the distance between f of x and that l value will be less than epsilon. That is what it means for the limit to exist at a point and be equal to L. Now, let's kind of unpack that. Now, we're not going to be too complicated with this here. I mean, we're just in Calc 1, and normally you really get into um, proofs of this kind. But this is also referred to as the epsilon delta definition. You might you might see that somewhere, so... So if a problem says, use the epsilon delta definition to find the limit, or use the definition of the limit to find the limit, they're talking about this guy right here this statement. And we're going to keep this simple because in general applying this, especially if you're in a case where you need to apply this, it's not going to be pretty. Um, but we are going to use it in some simple cases, so we're not going to get too complicated. Um, but if you do a class like advanced calculus, which is like a baby watered down version of real analysis, you will spend quite a bit of time a couple weeks or so just applying this definition in various cases and really getting used to using this definition. And so, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but now if you ever see it, there are a lot of cheesy math jokes out there where, because this was so quintessential, a lot of math people, you know, their first exposure to proof within that first week, this is what they are working with. So a lot of math people, this is like, you know, the day I became a mathematician was this day when I saw this definition. Yeah. And so, you'll have a lot of jokes where it's like, you know, a mathematician's arguing with his wife, and she's like, prove to me that you love me, and he's like, fine, let epsilon be greater than zero, and the joke will end there. And most people would not, what, that's a stupid joke, but math people would get it. This is why, because it's like, for all epsilon greater than zero, you usually start proving the limit by saying the statement, let epsilon greater than zero be given. And that's one of the first exposures to the world of proofs um, for a math measure. So, let's talk about what that means. Basically, this is defining what close means. It, by, by this definition, we can make close precise depending on who's asking the question. So someone will give you a tolerance that is your epsilon. I want the answer to be correct within two decimal places. Someone might say three decimal places. Someone might say 15 decimal places. I want you to be correct by this precision. That will be your epsilon, right? So for any such precision that anyone can hand to you, you need to show that you can find some number such that if your x value gets close to that number, gets close to a within that number, then your y value will get close to l within the given tolerance, right? So if someone says, I want the y values to be close within two decimal places, you can find a number so that if this happens, the difference between the function and the limit will be a number within two decimal places. That's going to be the ID. And every tolerance someone can give you, this has to work out for that tolerance. So the idea here, for you to see a picture, so you have a function doing this thing, whatever. And let's say you care about this location here. That's your A. This is your L. And someone says, OK, what do you mean the y values exist as we get closer and closer? How close do they get? What is close? And you might ask someone, what would you think of close? And someone might can say, OK, I want it to be within this window. Right? So L plus two decimal places, or three decimal places, minus. It must be within this window. The size of that window is what we call epsilon. 
That's the error you're allowed to be, right? How close are we getting to this y value? We need to be within this close. Someone will give you that number, right? And now you need to pick some number, delta, which once you're within that window of A, your y values will be within this window of epsilon. So for example, if you pick that window too wide, like here, you will notice that there are some y values of that function that are outside this window. Right? You need to show, no, it's possible to pick a window small enough so that all my y values will be within the window that you've given. So for example, if I only chose delta to be this small, right, where the distance here and here are the delta, then notice that once the x values are within that window, all the y values will be within this window that you've given. They won't be outside of it. They won't be too far away. If I get the x value to get super close to a, what do I mean super close? By this number specifically. Then the y values will be super close to l, what do you mean super close? By this value specifically. Right? I can choose a window on my x-axis so that the outputs will fall into a window on the y-axis. And I can choose this for any given number. So you can tell me, okay, I'm going to give you a window that's 0.01 wide. Okay, fine. Choose delta to be this number. Okay, what if I made it 0 0.00001? Fine. Then choose delta to be this number. What if it's like point a million zeros and a one. Okay, choose delta to be this number. Every time someone gives you a number here, you are able to find a number here to make it work out. Once you can do that, no matter what number you're given, the limit exists. Because that means no matter how close someone wants to get, you can make it work. And this is what we mean by getting arbitrarily close. Give me a tolerance, I can make it work. Now, when a limit does not exist, that cannot work. So for example, if there was a hole here, it doesn't matter what window I choose, there is no point where the output is going to be L, right? Or if there was a gap there, the same would hold true. There will be no window that I can choose that would make, that would make the output be L if the y value is in a certain window, right? This will only happen with continuous functions, and this makes the idea of being close precise. Precise in the sense that if anyone gives you a number, you can find another number that makes it work. So this is what being close means. Tell me what close means to you, and I will tell you the specific number that will make that work and satisfy your idea of closeness. So it's a very, um, it's a very subtle point, but it's. Um, let's actually, look, look, let me state the goal, uh, because sometimes that's confusing, that is, the goal of improving the limit exists by the above. actually finding the delta. That should be your focus, right? So you would assume epsilon greater than zero is given to you, right? So this is a number that over which you have no control. That tolerance will be given to you. Your focus should be finding the delta. What delta is going to work with this given epsilon, whatever it might happen to be? Yeah? And if I'm, is I, um, Am I reading that correctly, that like if L equals 1 and um, epsilon equals 2, then like the range is like 1 plus and minus 2, like epsilon's like right. one half of it? So that's the tolerance and the y values that you would allow, right? I would consider it close mm -hmm. if it's within one unit away. Okay, but so like then epsilon's just like one half. It's like above L, because you have like epsilon written twice. Am I making sense? Oh, so the upper limit would be L plus epsilon and then L to minus. L minus epsilon. Gotcha. So, so epsilon you'll add, add one gotcha. to, on either side. Makes sense. 
right? Yeah. So someone would say, what do I think close means? Well, it should be within one unit plus or minus of this y value. Gotcha. That's what close means. Gotcha. And you can say, okay, then maybe for that, if just going by random examples here, if you require me to be within one unit here, all I have to do is make sure that the x's are within half unit, right? So your response to that person would be, fine, give me a half unit tolerance here, and you will get your one unit tolerance there. Makes sense. And someone might say, what if I want a quarter tolerance, right? That value plus or minus a quarter. Okay, well in that case, you need to make this top window one over 23 units long, and that will give you your tolerance. Okay, what if I actually wanted this plus or minus 100? Well, in that case, if you make this one over a million, then you will get that window, gotcha. right? So whatever someone gives you, you'll be able to respond to them with the delta that's going to put the y value in that window. Gotcha. So the goal is to find the delta. Someone's going to give you an epsilon and you respond with a delta, right? But you need to be able to do that no matter what that is, right? And that's kind of the tricky part, okay? Right? So you don't know what this number is. It's just someone's going to tell you a positive number. So what you're going to need to do is you need to find a number based on that number. No, your delta may or will, depending if you think of a constant function, depend on that epsilon. Right? So your delta isn't just in a vacuum. It's a response to the tolerance you're given. Someone gives you an epsilon and you say, okay, choose delta to be this number and that epsilon is going to work out. Okay? So you can think of your delta as a function of epsilon. Give me a particular thing and I'll, 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 I'll tell you what you need to do. So that's the focus. Let's actually do a problem. I have a few examples here, but we can probably only get through one of them. Like I said, when, whenever I'm asking a problem like this, the limit is not going to be difficult, um, but it's just the way you actually express it and write this down that's going to be the really part. But the nice thing about these guys is, especially how I'm giving you, there's almost like a template for you to just fill in when solving the problem. Okay, so let's do an example. Prove. Right, so when you see that word prove, it doesn't say calculate or compute a limit, right? Prove that the limit is this, or use the epsilon delta definition to show blah, 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 or show that the limit is this. You're expected to use this definition. So prove that the limit as x approaches 4 of the expression 3x minus 7 is going to be the number 5. Prove that the limit as x approaches 3 over 2 of 4x squared minus 9 over 2x minus 3 is going to be the number 6. Prove that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared is actually 4. Now, all of these are ones that you should be able to compute very easily. A and C are directly plug-ins. For B, you need to simplify, factor the top, cancel stuff, and then plug in and those will work. So, computing limits as we've been doing before, pretty easy. But we actually want to prove this. We want to show that given any tolerance for the y values, I can tell you the tolerance you need to obey for the x values to make that work. And this is one of the first places where I guess we'll start to I built it up so much. In okay. We'll start there tomorrow. What's the, what's the quiz on tomorrow? The last week's stuff. Okay. Is it going to be any of this? Maybe the bonus. Okay. Yeah, so maybe if, if you practice for the, all the material last week and you think they're solid, you can maybe try your hand over some of these. 